Grace and peace, beloved of God. I am Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson, and we are back this week um, with this week's edition of Shatter the Silence. Um, our focus um, is domestic violence and the impact that it's having on um, on the people of God, on those that even you know don't even profess to be believers. Um, and it's an epidemic worldwide, and so this is something that the Lord has mandated us to discuss. We have a charge to come to you every week to empower you and to inform you. Hey, Re, um, we're going to ask you all to share. I'm going to give you all a few minutes to come on um, and to share, and um, then we'll get started. But the topic for this week is going to be choking versus strangulation. Let me begin by saying that neither one of those are a good thing, okay? Neither one of those. Is something that we want to have happen to us. Um, but one of my dear sisters in Christ, a fellow prophet, um, Michelle Detweiler, posted something on yesterday that really echoes um, a concern that I've had, you know, within my own heart, within my own being, and, and a conclusion that I came to many years ago. Um, as the Lord began to to prepare me for the prophetic and to occupy the office of an apostle. And that is, you know, in warfare, and I'm a military veteran, so a lot of times you'll get military examples from me, but it's important how we define a thing. And it's important that we understand whose definition we are embracing as we move through life, no matter what it is we're talking about. Because how we define a thing assigns a value to it and it determines, at least for us, right, what its function is in our life. And so it's important that as the Bible declares that our yea be yea and our nay be nay, um, that when we embrace a definition, that it is a sound definition, that it's not a definition that's been attributed to a situation or a set of circumstances simply because, in the case of domestic violence, simply because your abuser has decided that that's what it means. And so oftentimes, we remain bound, we stay bound, because we're accepting the enemy's definition for a thing. We're accepting his interpretation of our behavior. We're accepting his interpretation of our motivations. We're accepting his interpretation of what our purpose is or what our destiny is. And um, and that's a, that's a tremendous mistake because it paralyzes us and it distorts. It distorts what the actual objective is, what our actual purpose is, what our actual function is, okay? And so it's important that we understand that oftentimes the enemy will, he'll hijack a thing. Yesterday in her post, she was referring to um, this being Pride Month, um, and obviously there are very heated opposing views about its correctness, it's right, it's not right, or whatever. That's not what we're here to talk about. Um, the point that she made that I wholeheartedly embrace, and it's something that I have said for years, if you have followed me the last 20 years as I've ministered, is that how we define a thing is it's important because it determines our value to it. It determines our relationship to it, okay? And it determines... Hi, Tabitha. It determines um, what we hope to gain in this journey, in, in, in this trip, in this life, in terms of our purpose and our destiny. So if we accept the enemy's definition, then the goals that we are pursuing are inaccurate, right? They don't line up with our God-ordained purpose and destiny. And we're jumping the track and we don't even know it. And typically we'll go real hard in the wrong direction. So it's important that we identify what it is we do believe. And if you're a believer, then what does the word of God say? Because that's it. That settles it. If, if, if you are a blood-bought believer in Christ, then that's it. It's whatever the word says, right? Not what we wish it said, not what grandmama said it said, not what people told us it says. And so it's important that we have our own relationship. And so what does any of that have to do with domestic violence? 
at the core, at the heart of domestic violence, there is the enemy's attempt to distort the victim's view of him or herself, to distort the value that they place on their life, right? To distort what they have to even offer the world. And so if you remain in a situation in which you are being violated against, right? At some point, you lose sight of who you are. You don't know who you are anymore. You don't know who you are, and it becomes okay for them to treat you however they're treating you. It becomes okay for them to call you out of your name. It becomes okay. And after a while, you begin to think, well, maybe... I deserve that. Now, you couldn't embrace that. A victim can't embrace that unless they have first had their, their own value, their own sense of value, their own sense of self-esteem distorted. And this takes place over time. It is very gradual and it's very insidious. Now, me and my flesh, I would like to do things in an orderly manner, right? And let's talk about the signs and let's talk about this and let's talk about that. But I'm an apostle in the Lord's church and I get to do what he tells me to do, plain and simple. What he said for us to do a couple of weeks ago um, was to talk about gun violence. What he talked to, had us talk about was workplace violence. And in both instances, major things happened that had national attention around those two topics at the very same time that we were declaring it on our Facebook Live, okay? So what we have learned is to just do what we're told because he knows what his people need. He's the only entity that knows what every single viewer needs to take away from this live on today. And so this is not something that we take lightly. He directed us to talk about um, choking versus strangulation. And what that lets me know is that there are people who are watching this or people who are connected to those of you who are watching, who have experienced this or are experiencing this, and you have got the wrong definition about what is happening to you. Because you don't have the right definition, because you have an inaccurate definition, because you have a watered-down definition of what choking and strangulation is, you're not responding to it properly. You're not bringing the right amount of attention on it. You're not bearing, bringing to bear the right amount of even prayer on it. And so, you know, we can get deep and mystical and talk about prayer. Hey, Apostle, Lord Michael Hunt, love you. Hey, Greg. Hey, Dexter. Um, hey, Tabitha. Thank you for joining. If we don't define the thing properly, it just, it messes us up. It doesn't matter how much planning. It doesn't matter how much, we're not even praying about the right thing if we don't have the right definition, right? If, if we think something is a minor issue, we might take it to God, right? But if we are convinced that something is a serious, life-threatening, destiny-threatening issue, that's a different level of heat that is brought to that prayer. That's a different level of focus. It's a different level of warfare. It calls for a different weapon altogether, okay? And so the enemy, if, if, if he could just get you jacked up in terms of how you're defining the thing, that's half the battle. Because he doesn't have to worry about you gaining dominion over it. Why not? Because you don't even recognize what the actual problem is. So it's important. It's important that we define things the right way. And that means, and this is going to be hard for some of us, this means not just embracing what mama and grandmama said because they said it. It means getting into the word for yourself, developing a relationship of your own so that the Lord is able to direct you. This is what we know. This is what we know. Warning absolutely, absolutely, always, not sometimes, not every now and then, always comes before destruction absolutely all the time without exception why do we know that because that's what the word of god declares right so if it comes before destruction how are we getting our butts kicked the way we getting our butts kicked because we're not defining when the enemy takes a shot we're minimizing it when the enemy takes a shot we make excuses for it and we'll go back to what mama and grandmama said to justify the excuse. And we'll misappropriate scripture to make it okay, right? To be inactive, to not engage, to not address a thing. We know that domestic violence is like every other sin, every other scourge, every other thing that threatens mankind in our relationship with God in terms of eternity. Thrives in darkness. 
thrives in darkness. So, if evil thrives in darkness, what must the enemy do then to keep us quiet? If he can get us to embrace his definition of what domestic violence is, if he can get us to embrace his definition of what abuse is, if he can get us to accept his definition, that's half the battle. Because no matter what weapon we bring to the fight, it's the wrong one. Because we have not accurately assessed the enemy. All right? So I, I'm, I'm, I wish that I could, that I could, could give it to you the way I, I'm feeling it in my spirit. But it is imperative, it is imperative that we stop with the, with the sugar plum fairy tales and getting all deep and mystical and being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. People are sitting around us in church. They are in our Bible study groups with us. They are riding public transportation with us. They are on the job with us in the next cubicle. And then they're going home and they're being stripped of their humanity. And they are being mistreated. They are being cursed out, beat up, bones fractured. And we're around them all the time. And we need to be able to discern these things. The problem is the definitions that we use. The problem is the definitions that we use. Hi, everyone who signed on. So it's important that we define things correctly. God does not need us to water down an issue in order for him to be able to address it. I'm going to say that again. God does not need for us to water down an issue or to minimize its effect on us in order for him to be the great God that he is. He, he is a great God, period. Nothing's going to change that. He does not need our help. He does not have an identity issue. He is not confused about who he is. He understands who he is. All right? He understands who he is. We have to understand who he is. And we have to allow him to be God. And that does not mean I'm going to just pray about your black eye. And that's it. That's not what that means. That's not what that means. He depends on us. It's our whole entire function. If we weren't going to do anything for him, we didn't need to be born. Right? I'm just, I'm just saying. If we weren't going to walk in our purpose, why are we here? Because if we're not walking in purpose, then we're part of somebody's problem. We're tormenting somebody. Because we're out of God's will. Okay? So, I want to make sure that we understand. We're going to look at what the definitions are. Um, and then I want to share some information with you because I think statistics are important. Um, I think we need to understand how great of a problem that it is. But for those of you who have, who, who are advocates, who deal with people who are, you're in ministry, you have people submitted to you that are dealing with domestic violence. The first thing that you must be committed to doing if you're going to help them at all is do not minimize the severity of it. And don't think that you just talking to the abuser is going to solve the problem because y'all down like four flat tires and y'all golf together or y'all go to Denny's to have to church together or they've always listened to you because they didn't get your permission to go be abusive, right? So don't overestimate the influence that you have with that person who's being abusive. And I want to stress that women can be abusers as well. So, women can be abusers as well, okay? And when they are, they are off the chain. So, it's wrong no matter who's doing it. Whoever's doing it, they're dead wrong, okay? Now, if you have had someone place their hands around your neck during a domestic dispute, right? If you have been strangled because that's what it is you are seven times more likely to become a homicide victim i'm gonna say that again if someone has placed their hands around your throat right you're seven times more likely to become a homicide victim it's such a short hop skip and jump from that to flat out homicide that is frightening it's frightening. Here's what happens. When we talk about choking, right? Choking, where's my definition? I want to read you the exact definition. 
But choking is really defined as it's generally accidental and refers to when um, you keep an individual, when an individual is kept from breathing in a normal way by compressing or obstructing the windpipe, adulterating the available air, or block entirely the windpipe. So when we talk about choking, we are talking about you bit an apple and it got lodged in your throat. You had a piece of candy in your mouth and it got lodged in your throat. That's choking. Choking is accidental and it doesn't involve another person's hands around your throat. And so a lot of times when we're talking to victims, they'll say, well, he choked me or she choked me. And we minimize that. It's like, oh, well, you know, they just, you know, they didn't. No, 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 no. If you were eating and food got lodged in your throat, that's choking. If the air that you're breathing has become adulterated, let's say with gasoline fumes or something like that, then that's choking. Someone placing their hands around your neck is strangulation. And it's a lot more difficult to dismiss strangulation than choking. Choking doesn't sound so bad, does it? But it's also not an accurate definition. And so that's a perfect example of why it's important that we define things properly. We tend to, we, we minimize, we shrink it down, we make it manageable to us as though God can't handle the actual thing. And so the thing is, He'll address what you give him. You got to give him the right thing. You got to release the right thing to him in prayer. You've got to go boldly before the throne of grace with the actual issue and not a watered down version of the issue. Okay? Because it denotes a lack of confidence in his ability to fix it. He does not need us to help him to fix stuff for us. That's what he wants to do. Okay? Now, so I told you what, about that. Now let's look at strangulation. There are two types of strangulation. No, this is not a pretty topic, but I think we need to really understand. There are two types of strangulation. Okay. Ligature strangulation is strangulation with a cord-like object. The object can be anything from a telephone cord to articles of clothing, anything that's linear that you can wrap around someone's neck. It's also referred to as garroting and those of us that are military know what that is all right um the second type of strangulation is manual strangulation and it's also called throttling manual self-strangulation is impossible okay so by trade i'm a mental health professional right and so i've i've been an administrator i've been floor staff i've been therapist I've all these different positions inside psychiatric hospitals where patients may be acting out and may have a tendency to try to self-harm or become suicidal or whatever. The one thing that we never really worried about, we would document it, but we knew that a patient cannot, you cannot manually self-strangle and kill yourself. You cannot. It's impossible. So, I just wanted to say that. For, so, for those people who said, well, no, they did that to them, so you, you can't manually, you cannot. You cannot do it, Okay. Um, this type of strangulation is usually done with the hands, but notable variants include using the forearm, like in a chokehold, right? We see that a lot in terms of law enforcement, um, being trained to do that and they're supposed to do it safely, um, to standing or kneeling on the victim's throat. Okay. Now, so strangulation is something that is done to you, done to the victim, right? And it's done by placing the hands, um, if it's manual, by placing the hands around the throat, okay? Um, it can be done with the forearm. And this is not a how to strangle people thing, okay? So let me just throw that disclaimer right there in case I got a fruit loop on here. Um, what I want you to understand is if someone takes their forearm and presses it against your neck, against your throat, if they kneel in your throat, okay, if they do that, that is strangulation. That is what that is. It's strangulation, okay? It's not an accident. It's an intent to restrain, to control your behavior. 
your ability to move oxygen, okay? Now, oftentimes the person who's done it will minimize it, okay? So let's say there's a domestic dispute and um, strangulation occurs. Often what the abuser will say was all I did was choke her. I just choked her a little bit. I just choked her a little bit. And, and the misdefinition doesn't stop with the abuser minimizing. Often the victim will say choke. Often when the police are called, the dispatcher will say choked. Right? The people who respond will say choked. This is such a big deal now. This is such a big deal now. And in this country, it's a problem worldwide, but in the United States, it's a tremendous problem. So much so that in 2011, the Training Institute for Strangulation Prevention was created. So in 2011, a training institute was established in order to begin to educate police officers and domestic violence advocates and first responders regarding strangulation and how to recognize when it has occurred, all right? But it's helpful if we use the right terms in the event that we have to report on something like this. Because if we say, hey, Brenda, if we say choking, it automatically brings down the severity of it. You know what I'm saying? And, and we've learned that the proper definition is not choking. That's when you bite an apple and it gets lodged in your throat and the Heimlich maneuver fixes that most times, okay? That's choking. Strangulation is I am purposefully cutting off oxygen to your organs, to your brain, right? And I'm playing fast and loose with your life at this point. I'm playing fast and loose with your life at this point, okay? And as we said earlier, for those of you who had not been on here before, if someone has done that to you, if someone has done that, place their hands around your throat, place an article of clothing around your throat, a uh, clothesline around your throat, telephone cord around your throat, any linear object that they could wrap around your throat and constrict your airway, you are seven times more likely to become a homicide victim than anybody else. That's something to think about. Now, in Hosea, y'all know I like to reference this scripture because we, we, we hijack it and we misuse it and we don't apply it properly. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? And we preach about that and, you know, people get happy and all of that. But that's not the end of it. Again, we, we have to use things properly. It's a semicolon, it's not a period. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. Here's the issue, beloved. Warning always comes before destruction. And there is a press in my spirit to get this across to you, which means to me that someone viewing this is dealing with this right now. Okay, and this, and this is your answer. The information that we're providing you tonight is your answer. This is instructing you in terms of what you need to do next in order to stay alive, okay? Warning always comes before destruction. That means that every single time that we hear that someone close to us, near to us, dear to us, hey, Apostle India, someone near to us and dear to us has been victimized because of domestic violence or has been murdered because of domestic violence. The first thing people want to say is, I had no idea there was no indication. That's not true. It's not true. It's not true. We're walking around down here in a stupor and we're not paying attention. Warning absolutely always comes. It always does. And so if you've been in a position where you've lost someone near to you, I challenge you. Now, you might get angry with me, but that's all right. I challenge you to go back in your mind's eye, right? Take all your defenses down and ask God to show you what things were flashed in front of you, what things were brought to your attention that you dismissed. And take it a step further, because usually we don't go far enough when we're trying to resolve a thing. We'll identify with the problem and say, oh, okay, that was the problem. But that doesn't solve the problem. You want to also identify, what did I say to myself that minimized that thing? What did I say? Did I say, oh, no, he wouldn't do that. She must be exaggerating. Did I say, oh, I can't believe that they are a man of God. Did I say, oh, no, she's an apostle in the Lord's church. She couldn't have done that. There's no way. They did this. There's no way. Okay? So you want to ask God, 
what were the indications? Because the word of God says there are always indications. Always. Okay. Number two, what did we say to ourselves to make it okay to do nothing? It's important that you identify that. So the next time you hear yourself saying that to yourself, you'll know you're avoiding something. and You might be able to make some amends and fix it and get engaged. Okay. And then the third thing you want to ask yourself is, why did I, because it comes down to us, why did I need to believe so much that they were incapable of doing what they've been accused of? Why do I need to believe it? Because that's the bottom line. The bottom line is we'll dismiss and we'll minimize a thing because we don't want to believe because it, it messes with our perspective. It messes with our relationship, uh, the way we view a person, what we believe. It can cause a crisis in faith. But I submit to you that if you, if you go through that and you identify those three things, all right, then God can help you. Then God can help me. Okay, and I've learned this. this. I'm telling you what I know. I'm not telling you what somebody told me. I'm telling you what I know. Warning absolutely always comes before destruction. We're not responsive because we have a vested interest in being distant. We have a vested interest in seeing people a certain way. And it makes us useless. It almost makes us an obstacle. Those of us in, in positions of authority within the church, it, we become a problem. Because we become that person that the victim cannot talk to. We become that victim, that person that the victim cannot share what they are experiencing because it will be dismissed. Do you know that if somebody comes to us and says, I'm being mistreated, this is what's happening after the benediction. I know they preached a, 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 an amazing sermon and it was fire. And then right after that, X, Y, and Z happened. Right? If they're not able, if they're not able to bring that to us, because it takes everything in them, it takes everything in them. And the entire time the enemy is telling them how they better not tell and how bad things are going to happen if they tell and how they're not covering their, their partner if they tell that they're exposing their faults. So, so now the misappropriation of scriptures start. You should cover. Love covers a multitude of faults. Okay. Complete and total misappropriation of scripture. And we need to cut that out. But if we become that entity that won't hear, that won't listen, that won't intervene, that will minimize, try to justify, well, maybe they had a bad day at work. Oh, maybe you burnt their eggs. Oh, uh, uh, well, you know they have a history. Um, well, well, you know God is working on them. We need to stop. We need to stop. It shouldn't be that people around us that are being tormented cannot come to us. And because warning comes before destruction, right? Because warning comes before destruction, if you're hearing this, whenever you hear it, it can be the replay. Understand that God is holding us responsible, us, including me, holding us responsible for being who we are supposed to be to our brothers and sisters. Being who we're supposed to be in the earth. To whomever it is that needs us. All right. And so what I love about him is he'll draw a line in the sand. He'll make sure that you are aware that there was a clear opportunity presented for you to have questions, for you to be confused, for you to get unconfused. But that's just how he rolls. Okay. He wants to make sure that we understand. Once he does, we're accountable. We're, we can't unlearn it. We can't unhear it. We can't unsee it. So once the information has been presented to us, then we're responsible. For it, Okay, so going back to Hosea, my people are destroyed. That only happens when knowledge has been presented and rejected. I'm going to say it again. That only happens when knowledge has been presented and it is summarily rejected. Rejected. So if I'm the victim and I reject sound counsel and I reject information that helps me to understand the cycle of violence what i'm experiencing is abuse here are my options here's where you can get help if i reject that god didn't get me killed i got me killed if i reject that okay so 
what is our purpose? Our purpose is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to educate, to empower, to get people free who are bound because they don't understand. They're defining things the wrong way. They have, they're, they're drinking the Kool-Aid in terms of covering their partner and, and, you know, what happens in that relationship should stay in the relationship and don't talk to your friends about their, re okay. Everybody needs to be able to talk to somebody else outside, okay? Just so that we can get candid and get to the root of whatever the actual issue is in the relationship. So, we know the difference between choking and strangulation. Choking is something that happens by accident and it does not involve a ligature around your throat. It does not involve a forearm in your throat. It does not involve a knee or anything else cutting off your wind, your, your air, your oxygen, okay? Now, let me share some more statistics with you. One in four women experience intimate partner violence in their lifetimes and of women who are high risk, up to 68% will experience near fatal strangulation by their partners. One in four women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime and of women who are high risk, up to 68% will experience near fatal strangulation by their partner. 68% will almost die because of being strangled by their partners. Just think about that. That lets you know how commonplace it is, okay? Psychologically, what strangulation does is it imparts fear. It imparts fear. And typically, when the abuser does it initially, it's to instill that fear. That's the whole point to drive home the fact that your life is in my hands, literally, and I could kill you if I want to. I am capable of doing this, okay? And I'm, I'm going to let you go so that I can do this again. And the threat of this possibly happening again will probably be enough to keep you in line. You all hear what I'm saying? One in four women are going to experience domestic violence at the hands of an intimate partner, and up to 68% will experience near-fatal strangulation. 68%. That, that is mind-boggling. That statistic alone. Now, when we're talking about, about um, strangulation, it's important to note that Sometimes we might be hesitant to, to believe a person because they don't have any bruising, okay? African-American folk, for one, we don't bruise like everybody else unless you're really, really fair-skinned. It could be two or three days later before you see any indication that something violent actually occurred. So that's, that's number one. Number two, it's possible with strangulation that there are no marks. There's no bruising on the neck, that there is no bruising. It's very possible. But if law enforcement is not aware of this, if domestic violent advocates aren't aware of this, if the dispatcher is not aware of this, if the people treating this individual are not aware of this, it's easy to believe the abuser who is probably very convincing and oftentimes is very articulate and educated and everything else, right? Because anybody can be an abuser. If a victim says, well, he choked me, and they said, well, Apostle Cheryl, you know, he choked me and, and, and this is what happened. And I'm looking for evidence, right? Because, you know, I don't want to accuse anybody. I don't want to accuse nobody unjustly. So we look for evidence, supporting facts. You look at the victim's neck and you don't see any bruising. How much credibility does the victim now have with you? Honestly. How much credibility, especially if they're talking about your favorite prophet, your favorite preacher, your BFF from the sandbox when you were in second grade. If they're talking about someone that, that you love, someone that maybe you have given a lot of responsibility in ministry. So now, if this person is jacked up, that's a, like a reflection on your judgment, is it not? Right? 
So, if there's no evidence of strangulation, then what? Many of us would assume, well, that must mean that either it didn't happen at all or it wasn't as bad as the victim says. It couldn't have been that bad because it would have left some marks, right? I mean, if they if they squeezed enough or choked enough to actually cut off the air, then um, it should leave a mark. No. 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 And that's why we're doing this live. It is very possible for near-fatal strangulation to occur vicious strangulation to occur and there is no nice way to strangle someone okay and there be no marks even days later it's very possible so much so that forensically they are now developing infrared like cameras things that are able to pick up the bruising that's not um visible to the naked eye so if you are a victim of strangulation don't allow the fact that maybe there is no bruising. Don't minimize. We're back to how we define things. Don't minimize the possible damage. If you are a victim of strangulation, it is imperative that you get medical help. It is imperative. Even if you feel like you're fine. Even if you did not lose consciousness. All right? It's imperative. Because there are internal injuries that can occur where you can die days or weeks later from an event like that. Days and weeks later. So it doesn't have to happen the, the day that the incident actually occurs. Okay, does everybody understand that? It's imperative. Again, even if you feel that you've not lost consciousness at all, that you seek medical help. And it's important that you report it. It's important that you report it. Anybody tell you not to report it? I don't care if they're an apostle, archbishop. I don't. It does not matter. That is not God. If someone puts their hands around your throat, you need to report that. You must report it. You're seven times more likely to become a homicide victim. And what will happen is you'll end up getting killed and there'll be no record of there being a problem ever which affects how the abuser is then addressed. Is this a first-time instance? Is this a pattern? It makes a difference. So even if I want to play fast and loose with my own life, I, I feel that I don't have a right to put myself in jeopardy, mess around, and get strangled to death, and then leave that critter loose to strangle some old people because, because I didn't tell anybody that that was happening. Okay. All right. I mean, we, we have to be responsible for more than just ourselves on this planet. Okay. And, and if you name the name of Christ, we're required to care about more than just ourselves. Okay. All right. Let's see what else I can share with you today. Loss of consciousness can occur within five to 10 minutes. Within five to 10 minutes, loss of consciousness can occur. Prosecutors are largely shifting towards filing attempted murder charges in these cases. Now, I'm not sharing that with you for you to get all sympathetic about the person that is abusing you. Okay? I'm sharing this with you to let you know how serious it is. You know how hard it is to change laws in this country. And if the shift is towards filing attempted murder charges, it's because it is happening so often. It's happening so often that now there are statistics that if this, this, and this happens, then this is probably going to be the next thing that happens. That's how commonplace it is. Okay? Before I get off of here, I'm going to share a website with you that you can go to and check out your own abuse situation where you plug in the information and it'll let you know the likelihood of this, this, and this happening. Um, and it's developed by Gavin DeBecker, who is a world-renowned personal protection expert. He has protected um, dignitaries, presidents, Rich people, corporations, he's an expert. And they've developed a computer program where you can plug in information and, and get like a clinical, computer-based assessment of what's going on in your situation. Now, I'm not telling you to use that and decide whether you stay in or leaving. I'm telling you to use it so you can understand how serious your situation is, okay? Um, and, and let me just say this. 
typically when, when, when it increases and escalates to a place where strangulation is an issue, it didn't start off there. Like, they don't choke you out on the first date. Okay. They don't take you to go see Aladdin and then they choke you out after that on the first date. That's not how that goes. So typically it's gradual. It's building. They get you to a place where you are accepting of the mistreatment. You're accepting. You're making excuses. And they're testing limits. And they're determining how far that they can go. Okay. So some more information that I'd like to share with you. Common excuses of abusers are, I didn't mean to choke her that hard. Or I didn't know my own strength. 97% of victims that are strangled, I told you that it's possible you can do it um, manually or you can do it with cloth or clothesline or telephone cord or whatever. 97% are strangled with hands. That's very, that's very, I despise you. I think you shouldn't exist. I think I should control your life. I'm looking into your face and I'm squeezing the life out of you is what I'm doing. That is unbridled hatred. That is not love. That is unbridled hatred. If I'm going to put my hands around your neck and squeeze, and it takes 33 pounds of force, 33 pounds, find something in your house that weighs 33 pounds and balance it on your fingertips. That's how much pressure it takes. That's how much pressure it takes. Sustained pressure. 33 pounds or more of sustained pressure on your throat will kill you. So if I'm going to do that, that's personal. And that's not love. I despise you if I do that. I despise you. And I despise you so much that I can look you dead in your face and do that to you. Now, that sounds harsh. But that's, but that's what it is. And again, oftentimes we, especially church folk, we stay in these situations because we're, we're not defining things accurately. We are minimizing them. We are making it pretty, preparing to present it to the Lord in prayer, okay, rather than just talking to him because, I don't know, he sent his son to die for us and he loves us and, and we can just talk to him. We don't have to dive deep into the, you know, the King James language and, we don't have to do all that. Just talk to him. Just talk to him and tell him the truth about what's going on. Tell him the truth about what you need from him. Ask him for help and then be open to help when it's presented because warning always comes before destruction. It always comes, okay? So, 90%, 97% of victims were strangled manually with hands. 35% are strangled during a sexual assault or abuse. 9% are also pregnant. 70% of strangled women believe they were going to die. So, 70% of the women who were strangled believed that they were going to die. If you were choked once, you will most likely be choked again. If you were choked once, you will most likely be choked again. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. And, and I always hesitate to tell somebody to just leave because... They're leaving, coming back and forth will escalate things. If you, things get ratcheted up really fast when you do that. So you should believe that you're ready to stay gone when you do leave, okay? That's the best I can tell you. But I will tell you this. If things have escalated to a place where hands have been placed around your throat, whether you are the man or whether you are the woman, you need to get out of there. You need to be out and get out of there because as we shared at the beginning of this broadcast, you are seven times more likely to become a homicide victim. Right? And if things have gone that far, nine times out of ten, there's a series of other things that happen that maybe you've not reported, that you've not shared with anyone. Okay? So it's important. It's important that you confide in someone. Someone needs to know what is going on. Someone who is not submerged in this toxic situation that can see things clearly that has your best interest at heart okay that's very very important so if you were choked once you will more than likely be choked again um you are at tremendous risk for being killed by someone who has choked anyone before anyone <laughs> listen listen let me address this 
there are many times that women will come to me, especially, and I've had a couple of men too, but women will come to me and say, well, you know, I left him and it's been two years, it's been three years, and now he's seeing somebody else and I'm concerned about her. Well, part of that is you're concerned about her and part of that is maybe you still connected, okay? So let's just be honest. The best you can do is to warn her. Realizing that you're taking a chance if you do. There's a real good chance she won't receive it. There's a real good chance she won't receive it. There's a real good chance she'll say you're the problem. Um, she will believe whatever he has told her nine times out of ten. That does not relieve us of the responsibility to make people aware, though. Okay? Once you've done that, leave it alone. Because... Warning comes before destruction. The Bible doesn't say how many times. Okay. Warning comes before destruction. So our responsibility when we are aware of a danger is to inform someone somehow, even if you have to do it anonymously, to at least let them know what to look for. Because nine times out of ten, you've been painted as the ex. You've been painted as the problem. You didn't appreciate them. You were whatever, 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 whatever. You were ratchet, whatever. Whatever they needed to say about you to explain their own history. Even if they've been arrested. It was misappropriated justice. It was not right. The police believed them and didn't believe me. And you know what I'm saying? So, but we still have a responsibility to say what we know. Okay? And like I said, even if you have to do it anonymously. Um, only half of... Okay, so only half of strangulation victims have injuries. So again, and this is important because it, it impacts how we respond to people when they say to us that they are in a domestic violence situation. The fact that you don't see any bruising, the fact that you don't see any marks of strangulation does not mean it didn't happen, okay? Because what we know now is that half of victims don't show any outward indication that there's, that strangulation has taken place, Okay. Um, and of those, only 15% could be photographed. So again, they're developing special forensic cameras so that they can photograph injuries um, and that it will be, they'll be able to see it. Because the other thing that happens is the police come, you know, the charge is made, a picture's taken, there's no bruising on the neck. The case goes to trial, the jury's like, well, we don't see no bruising. So again... Even in our, our law enforcement and even in our system of law, there's education that needs to occur because people on the jury expect, as most people would, if they weren't educated about this, that if strangulation occurred with the force that could kill someone or cause damage, there would surely be bruising. And now we know that half of those cases won't have any bruising that's visible to the naked eye, okay? Now, um... I already told you that death can occur days or weeks after. Okay, so it's important. Please, 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 please. If you have been the victim of strangulation, please go get checked out. Um, you can have a carotid artery dissection. You can have respiratory complications. You can develop pneumonia. You can develop acute respiratory distress or ARD. You can have blood clots travel to your brain from the choking, okay? There's also psychological injury that occurs. Many victims end up with PTSD, um, depression, suicidal ideation, memory problems, nightmares, anxiety, severe stress reaction, amnesia or psychosis, all from strangulation. Let's see. What else do I need for you to know? I really just want to provide you with information so that you understand um, how serious it is. Okay? So, there are four stages that a strangulation victim goes through during the time that the strangulation occurs. And stage one is disbelief. The victim cannot believe that their air or blood supply is being stopped. You just can't believe it, right? Stage two is realization. 
they realize that they are losing air and blood supply and they're thinking about survival. They're thinking about their family, their ministry, their life, their children, the things that they care about. Stage three is primal. And that's where victims fight with whatever means that they have available to them to try to get air back um, or to try to get blood flow back. So sometimes strangulation victims have claw marks on their, on, their, on their throat or their neck where they're trying to break free and they're trying to get air. And then stage four is resignation. And that's the point at which the victim gives up because they feel that they can't do anything and they know that they're going to die and they go limp and they give up. So there's four stages. Victims have reported, those who, um, who have had near fatal strangulation, have reported that they feel an overwhelming feeling of helplessness and vulnerability. Um, they realize, they understand that they barely survived. They feel like evil is ever threatening, is ever present, which is exactly what the Bible tells us, okay? And they have this constant feeling of terror or danger or of not being safe. And this is because of what they have experienced. Um, and, and the difficult thing is, knowing that someone that they love, someone that they cared about, someone that they invested in, someone that they poured into, maybe even poured into financially, maybe even helped them build a business, whatever, whatever, maybe help them raise children that weren't theirs, that someone that they have given that much of themselves to has decided that they don't need to live, that they're not worth living, that their life has no value. And so emotionally, that is potentially devastating, okay? Just knowing that someone could do that to you. So this is what you need to look for or listen for. Someone comes to you and tells you that they have been a victim of strangulation or they'll probably say choking. You can correct them now and say, no, that's strangulation. Choking is when you bite an apple and it gets caught in your throat, okay? There are often breathing changes. It could be hyperventilation, difficulty breathing, unable to breathe. The breathing is labored or it's loud and it may have a hissing sound. You may notice voice changes, a raspy voice, a hoarse voice, coughing, or they're unable to speak. Uh, there may be changes in their ability to swallow. They may have trouble swallowing. It might hurt to swallow. They may complain of neck pain. They may be nauseous. They may be vomiting or they may be drooling. Um, and one thing that, that can complicate it, let's just say there's an incident and there's, there's strangulation and the police are called. If they don't understand what we're talking about now, this, this whole thing can be just misunderstood. And so oftentimes, because of a lack of oxygen to the brain, there are behavioral changes that the police may view as being uncooperative, right? So they might be combative. They might be agitated, traumatized. They may have amnesia, not able to remember things. They may be hallucinating, all because of the decrease in blood and oxygen flow to the brain. But if you're just coming into contact with this person and the abuser is telling you, well, this person was the problem. And when they come, you know, you're off the chain as the victim. You see how things can get turned around? So it's important because this is usually not the first thing that happens. It's so important that there is a history established if it's, there's ongoing abuse so that when people respond, whether it's a therapist, an advocate, the police, they know where they are in this cycle. It's not just some person claiming that they've been strangled, right? And there's no history. There's no report of calls. There's no restraining order. There's no nothing. So when we hide it, it only benefits the abuser, okay? So it's important that we avail ourselves of the help that is available. And again, this institute was established in 2011, which is awesome because it means that the legal system is beginning to recognize that domestic violence is fairly complex. It's fairly complex, okay? Um, and they're wanting to do a better job of managing it um, and addressing it. So some other changes that you can have if you are a victim of strangulation are muscle spasms, dizziness, headaches, fainting, 
urination, defecation, all of that can happen when, when the oxygen is, is, is cut off, okay? Uh, seizures can occur. Um, a possible uh, miscarriage if the victim is pregnant. Evidence of a concussion. Visible injuries. When there are injuries, this is what they may look like. Um, regarding the face, the face can be red or flushed. Uh, the face may have pinpoint red spots or petechia. Uh, it could be confused, could be confused for a rash. Um, and if when you feel it, you feel bumps, it's probably acne. It's usually smooth and can appear on many parts of the body. So, you know, if you watch CSI and programs like that, you hear about petechial hemorrhaging in the eyes. But what I want you to understand is you can have that hemorrhaging in other parts of the body as well. Okay. Um, you may see defensive scratch marks, uh, palsy or drooping, facial drooping of the left or the right side. Uh, regarding the eyes and the eyelids, you can have petechia to the right or left eyeball or eyelid. And that's when you can have a sub subconjunctival hemorrhage or a bloody red eyeball where the eyeball itself is a bloody red. Like the whites of the eye are a bloody red, okay? That's an indication of strangulation. Um, and that's usually caused by, and not just, not just the abuser squeezing, but squeezing, letting go. Squeezing, letting go. Squeezing, letting go, which affects the blood flow, right? And so that's how you get the bloody red eyeball. So if you're looking at someone with, with, with those indicators and they tell you that they've been strangled, they have probably been strangled, okay? On the nose, you can have petechia. Uh, on any part of the head and neck, um, the nose may be bleeding. The nose may be broken. You may have red marks on the nose that are related to the pinching of the nostrils, okay? Um, you can have petechia hemorrhaging on the inside or the outside of your ear, you may have thumbprints, bruise marks behind the ear. So behind here, all right? Bleeding from the ear canal is also an indication that strangulation has occurred. The mouth may be swollen or bruised. The tongue can be swollen. The lips can be swollen. You can have cuts and abrasions or bite marks where the victim is trying to get free. Um, and so they're biting their own lip. Under the chin, you can have redness or scratch marks bruising or abrasions on the chest um, from being constrained or acts of self-defense. You can have redness, scratch marks, bruises, or abrasions, okay, on the chest. So this, these, this, all of this, all of this happens often, okay? The shoulders from being constrained or from acts of self-defense, you can have redness, scratch marks, bruises, abrasions, the neck can have redness, scratches, petechia, thumbprint bruises, ligature marks, fingernail impressions, claw marks from trying to get free. You can have petechial hemorrhaging on the scalp, the actual scalp. The hair can be pulled out. There can be a bump on the head or a skull fracture. Um, pulmonary damage, um, internal um, injury to your lungs from strangulation, pulmonary edema, aspiration, um, pneumonia, coughing up of blood. I mean, this is, these are things that can result, right? And so the fact that if you've been the victim of strangulation, the fact that you didn't die is not, that's awesome, but you need medical help, all right? Um, please, please, please report it. Please, 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 please report it. So to recap, Nearly four in five victims of strangulation are strangled manually with the hands. 97% also involve blunt force trauma. Neck lesions are not always present. You may notice changes in the voice, neck pain, difficulty swallowing or breathing, ear pain, vomiting blood, vision change, tongue swelling, bloodshot eyes, um, lightheadedness, if the victim is pregnant, she may experience miscarriage. Um, and during strangulation, the trachea is constricted, making it difficult or impossible to breathe, okay? Um, and so the two combined can cause asphyxia and unconsciousness. 
And if it goes on for long enough, then it can result in death. Just remember that the fact that you didn't lose consciousness does not mean that you don't have some serious internal injuries. So you please, please, please. I cannot emphasize enough. I cannot emphasize enough that you be seen at an ER, that you be seen by a doctor, um, that you report it, that it's documented, okay, so that people are better able, um, they're positioned where they can assist you when you decide you are ready to leave a situation. What is the takeaway? The takeaway is this. If someone says to you that I've been abused, if someone says to you that they choked me, they put their hand around their throat, they wrapped the cord around my throat, the fact that there's no bruising does not mean that they're not telling the truth. It does not mean that they're not telling the truth, okay? So please, 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 you know, even if you don't believe them, provide them with resource information. You can hit up our Facebook page. You can instant message me. They can direct message me. Provide them with information. The Bible says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and because the knowledge has been rejected. Not because the knowledge was not available, but because it was not apprehended, because it was not applied, because it was not made available. All right? So it's, it's important. We can save lives if we just pass on what we know. If we purpose in our hearts to be a better neighbor, to be a better friend, to be a better sibling, a better apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, a better deacon, a better church mother, and actually take care of and pay attention to what is going on around us. And so I challenge you, I challenge you to, number one, ask yourself, if someone has come to you and said that they are a victim of abuse, ask yourself why you need to not believe it. Why, why is it important to you that that not be true? Right? Um, what did you say to yourself to make it okay to do nothing? What did you say to make it okay? Well, that's just how they interact. Well, they haven't hit each other yet. Well, they're a good provider. Well... You know, she's kind of moody. She's kind of irritable anyway. Well, you know what I'm saying? What are what kind of atmosphere are we creating? Are we creating an atmosphere where the people who need us know that they can come to us? Or have we created an atmosphere where they're concerned that we're going to make it worse if they come to us? Because if that's the case, we'll have to answer to God for that. We will all have to answer to God for that if that's the case. Okay. So, those are the main things that I want you to take away. Um, there was a study by the Maine Coalition to End Domestic Violence, and they found that nearly three in four survivors did not seek medical attention after being strangled. So, three out of four people who are strangled don't seek medical attention afterwards. And I just gave you a long list of reasons about why that's a bad idea, okay? Because there's so much that can be damaged internally that you could literally die weeks later from an incident that happened weeks ago. Um, even if you don't have hoarseness, even if your neck doesn't hurt, even if you don't have petechial hemorrhaging, even if your eyeballs are not bloody red, right? Even if none of that is the case, please get checked out. Please get checked out, okay? Please, okay. I want to make sure I'm not forgetting to share anything with you. Um, in some instances, people have told me that strangulation has occurred um, in the middle of a heated argument. There have been other instances reported where maybe the victim was strangled. Strangulation uh, commenced while they were sleeping, you know, laying down, had their back turned or, or, or whatever. Um, so it can occur at any time. Um, and it seems that most, most abusers don't strangle to actually kill off the top at first, but to establish that they can and that they're willing to do it. And it's how they maintain control. We talked about how 
there's PTSD, there's all kinds of things that can happen. There are behavioral changes that can occur. Um, to us, it might look like an attitudinal change, you know, like, like a person's being really irritable or moody or uh, isolative or whatever. Uh, and we need to ask ourselves when people's behavior changes, what is going on that's causing the change, okay? As opposed to getting offended by the behavior that's being produced. Um, a study published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine found that women who survive strangulation by their partner are seven times more likely to be the victim of an attempted homicide, and they are eight times more likely to be the victim of a homicide. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like those, those odds. How do you survive if you become the victim of strangulation? Now, First of all, I'm not encouraging anybody to stay. If you've already been strangled, they're going to probably kill you if you don't get out of there, okay? And again, it doesn't have to happen in the middle of a heated argument. It can occur while you are sleeping. It can occur when your back is turned. You don't have to have any notice that it's going to happen. Um, Chris Watts, that well-publicized case, the guy in Colorado who killed his pregnant wife and his two little girls, they believe he strangled her after she had gone to bed. Okay, they'd had an argument in her mind. They had made up. And he strangled her. Okay, so she was defenseless, pregnant, and half asleep when that happened. Okay. Um, if you are the victim of a strangulation, what you want to do, like in, in any instance where you feel under attack, you want to try to remain calm because if you... If you don't, it'll be difficult for you to think, okay? Um, and then you can use what they call the turtle shell technique to... Let me position myself so you can see. The turtle shell technique to try to protect your airway. And you basically, you want to tuck your chin and raise your shoulders. You want to... Something like this, okay? You want to do that with the objective being to protect your airway. So tuck your chin... Raise your shoulders up to support your neck. Um, push comes to shove, and, and they still don't let go. Sometimes what works is if they think they've already accomplished what they're trying to accomplish. If you just go limp and wait for an opportunity to try to fight or get away. The best thing for you to do is if you know that your situation has escalated, 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 it started off with name calling. It started off criticizing you, embarrassing you in front of your friends. Then there was a little pushing, then a little shoving. Maybe it was couched in play fighting, which is not not playing. They're not playing, okay? Um, and it's gradually got ratcheted up over time. You've got to let somebody know that this stuff is going on. You've got to let somebody know so that they can help you to make a sound decision and so that they can help you to appropriate the proper information, the proper safety plan, so that you can save your life. Okay? It's very, very, very important. So, not a fun, happy topic, domestic violence, but it's something that is needed. It has reached silent epidemic proportions even in the church. Um, and so... God is wanting us. He's holding his church accountable. He's holding us responsible. And there are many of us who he is charged with making sure that we stay on top of this, that we cry aloud, and that we spare not. Okay? I want you to know that you can reach out to me by direct message. You can hit up any one of my three Facebook pages. We did launch on June 1st. Um, a domestic violence group is faith-based. Uh, so if you don't believe in God or if you're not a spiritual person, that's probably not a group you want to join because we talk about God over there. Um, and how he's able to help us, to deliver us, bring us out. Um, it's designed to be a support group and to be a group that provides awareness and encouragement. Um, and you can join because you have a history or you can join because you know people who have been affected by it. You can join because you're in it right now and you just need some support so you can decide what to do. Um, and you're welcome. And you're welcome. Okay? So... It is called Dominion Over Domestic Violence. You can, you'll have to answer two or three questions that will help me to know if this is an appropriate place, if this is a group that's for you or not. Um, but feel free. You can let other people know about it. And um, 
and then we'll go from there. But it's designed to be a support. And since we all need support sometimes, even if you start off giving support, you may find that you need support at some point, and that's okay too. We are here for you, okay? We are here. We're committed. We believe God. We know that there is nothing too hard for him. And like I told you before, one of my favorite quotes is what Harriet Tubman said. I have freed a thousand slaves and I could have freed a thousand more if only they had known that they were slaves. Our goal and our mission and our mandate is to raise awareness, to put light on it, to make it very, very difficult for the enemy to continue to do what he's doing in the house of God. Domestic violence is a scourge. It is a problem. It is an epidemic. It's a pandemic, according to the United Nations Secretary General, um, of global proportions. And the only way we can eradicate it is to shed light on it, not be quiet about it, and be intentional about being a help to those around us who may be subjected to it. If someone comes to you and says that they're in a domestic violence situation, please do not judge them. Please do not tell them what you would not allow a person to do to you. Don't do that. Don't ask them, do you care about your children at all? Don't ask them that like that. Don't do that. All right? What they need is to know that they are loved. And what they need is information that counters what the abuser is saying to them. Because if they don't get something positive from us, all they're getting is negative from the abuser. They're getting torn down and torn down and torn down. Okay? So... I want to encourage you to give. I'm horrible about this. If you want to give, the things that God has given us to do are not free. They cost money. Um, so donations are appreciated. You can um, donate to our cash app. Um, if Kelly's on, I'll ask her to put it on. At um, Our cash app is Judas Roar. And then our PayPal is paypal.me slash Judas Roar. Also... You can find our videos on Facebook. We've done videos on safety planning. We've done an, a video on an overview of domestic violence. We've done a discussion regarding gun violence. We've done a discussion regarding when domestic violence and the workplace converge. Um, we There's so many topics we can do. Next week, we're going to look at what some of the red flags are. It's impossible for me to give you an exhaustive list of red flags. There are so many and there are, for every red flag, there are three or four variations of that very same red flag that's changed from situation to situation, that's tweaked just a little bit by the abuser um, so that it may stay under the radar of the victim. Okay, so, but we want to, as much as we can, provide you with information so that you are able to stay safe, keep your children safe, and go forth and do what God has created you to do. Hey, Ladero. So I thank everyone for coming on um, tonight. Please share these videos. It's, it's together we can make a difference. Now, I'm just one person by myself, but together we can make a difference. And if everybody shares and encourages the people that they share it with to share, then we can get this information out to people. There's a difference between choking and strangulation. It's important that we define things accurately and it's important that as believers, we refrain from minimizing the scope of our challenge, the scope of our problem. No matter how big our problem is, our God is greater. So he does not need us to minimize it and make it manageable, okay? So let's stop doing that. We can be frank with him about what we need from him. We can be frank with him regarding what is hurting us. We can be frank with him regarding our fears, our concerns, um, and for those of us who hold positions of responsibility in ministry, I challenge you to be intentional. I challenge you to be intentional about being available to people and paying attention so that we can be a better help and a better support. All right? Make sure you're defining things properly. Choking is when you bite an apple and it gets stuck in your throat. That's choking. Strangulation, right? is manual it's with the hands or with an item that's wrapped around the throat okay it's intentional it's designed to terrify you if not kill you altogether if you are a victim of strangulation you must please 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 get medical attention 
even if you do not lose consciousness because you could die weeks later because of internal injuries that went undetected. And the last thing that I want to recap is this. If someone comes to you and says that they've been strangled, okay, or they've been choked, if they tell you they've been choked, not that I choked on an apple, I was eating my sandwich and I choked, they mean strangled. So let them know that that's what happened, that they were strangled. The fact that they may not have bruising does not mean that they're not telling the truth. The fact that they don't have bruising and that they're accusing your favorite apostle or prophet or preacher or deacon or teacher or police officer or whoever does not mean that it didn't happen. Okay? All right. So that's it for this week. Blessings to you. We appreciate you. And again, we're asking you to share. If you want to donate, give. There are many things that God has put on our heart to do in terms of raising awareness, but it takes capital to do it. And so anyone that wants to help with that, we appreciate it. All right? Feel free to reach out to us at any time. Share, 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 share so we can get this information out. All right? Blessings to you. We'll be back next week.